John um, wasn't able to be here, so um, he asked me to introduce Mike to, to you. I don't think I need to do any introduction for Mike, but he said um, something quite um, interesting. He said, I normally talk about the future, but this time I'm talking quite a lot, we talk about the past. So um, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Just before we start, just one little thing. Just a reminder, next month is the AGM, and we're having a keynote speech from the president of the BCS. So uh, we would like as many members to attend as possible. <laughs> okay, thank you very much uh, for coming to my talk tonight, and um, I see many faces in the audience that I recognize, but if anyone doesn't know me, I'm Mike Small, I spent 27 years working for ICL, 15 years working for Computer Associates, and uh, I'm, now, <laughs> I, I, I'm now retired, but uh, an industry analyst and a university lecturer. So uh, tonight, uh, as, as the introduction said, instead of talking about the future, I'm going to talk about the past. And uh, in this, we're going to talk about uh, how the Greeks won the battle because of information security, how a queen lost her head because of information security, and how um, the First World War, with course of the First World War, was changed because of it. So, and then we'll work on to more modern things, and it's difficult uh, to talk about everything that's happened, but I will go through some of the notable developments that have happened in the technology since the advent of the computer age, computerization age. So basically, um, this is an age-old problem, uh, which first of all was mechanized, then it was digitized, and then made even worse by the fact that we're all interconnected. So <coughs> information has always been something that was uh, important, and it's really uh, you, you can see this from these things. I don't know if you recognize this. That is a cuneiform tablet. There are tens of thousands of these in the British Museum, which is not a long way from here. And I was in, interested in this because in 2007, I picked up the telegraph. And here was a picture of this <clears throat> under the heading of stone tablet confirms the existence of the old age testament person. And it was, uh, somebody had uh, uh, translated that uh, tablet, and it was mentioning on the tablet someone who is also mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible. Now I'm just a sorry, sad person, and I read what it said and thought, that's actually a receipt for payment. And it basically was a receipt that had been given to a eunuch who had been sent to the temple to deposit some gold on behalf of his master. <coughs> now, I would have called it a ghoulie chair had he not, not been actually a, a, already a eunuch. But in a sense, it was in the same vein as those of you who, uh, after a business trip, have to take your um, bills back in order to get reimbursed. Well, in this particular case, if he wanted to continue living, he had to prove he'd given the gold. Now, most of these tablets uh, actually are of that form. For those of you that were hoping to find some deep secret of the ancient knowledge and wisdom of the, of the old people, will be disappointed. Because most of them were actually just about running business. And indeed, it turns out there were 
well-developed techniques for altering and defrauding and changing those talents. Now, um, moving on to ancient Greece, well, there's a lot happened in ancient Greece, and uh, in, in fact, in Herodotus, who writes uh, some memoirs, uh, there, was, there is a story about a man called Demaratus, and Demaratus sort of fell out with the Greek powers because he opposed the um, policies and the putting in place of a certain king and ended up being exiled in, uh, in Persia. Uh, but he was known to be a powerful man, so he sort of allied himself with Xerxes, who was the Persian emperor. And um, Xerxes was thinking of having another go at invading Greece. And so he asked um, Herodotus, um, Dem 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 Demaratus, what uh, he thought might happen, and there was a, a discussion. Uh, now, at the end of this, Demaratus must have felt some pang of guilt because he wanted to pass a message to the Greeks in Sparta to say, hey, hey lads, watch out, the Persians are coming. So he figured out a way of sending a message, and what he did was he took one of the writing tablets, which in those days were made of a box, a wooden box, which contained wax. And so it was a rewritable memory. So you could, uh, you wrote on the wax, and um, then when you finished, you erased it. Well, he put the message underneath the wax. And there's a story about how the uh, Spartan queen had a dream, and she worked out how to read this. Anyway, the net, net result of that was in the series of battles that started at Thermopylae, because the Greeks had warned they were able to use naval tactics, which in fact um, won the battle uh, uh, later on. So, passing secret messages 480 BC. And um, now, again, moving, uh, continuing with ancient Greece, uh, it, it's interesting to see the problem about trust. And we see this now in some of our technology. You know, I'm sure that you, you look at the trusted sellers on eBay and all this kind of thing. Well, in ancient Greece, if you thought that a particular person was untrustworthy, then you could write their name on shards of broken pottery and put that name in a pot. And every month they'd check that pot out. And if there was over a certain number of, of records of the same name, then that person was banished from the city from te for 10 years. And those shards of pottery were called ostraka. And that is the basis of the English word ostracism. Now, so, and then what you can actually see, those are taken, I think I took that photograph in, uh, in one of the um, uh, museums uh, in and around Athens. So trust and, uh, if you will, being able to uh, show your trust or not in people uh, is, was, was, was an important thing in those days. They could use that system there for bankers. Mm, yes. <laughs> yes, I wonder what people would think of that. Now, again, on the line of trust, um, here is a medieval technology for enforcing trust, and they were called tally rods. Now, the problem here is if you lent some money to somebody, or if you borrowed some money from somebody, how do you make sure that there is a record of that transaction which neither side can alter in order to defraud? defraud? So the idea was, what you took was you took a stick, and into that stick you carved a number of notches according to some agreed system. For example, you might say, if I lent you 10 pounds, we would carve 10 notches. Having done that, you then split the stick down the middle, and each party took away their own half. And it's very difficult to fraudulently create, recreate a split stick. But these tally rods were actually used. And indeed, there was a time when um, 
the accounts of, uh, of, of um, businesses and the accounts of people were in fact recorded using that and there was kind of a bit of an uproar when people moved to paper bookkeeping. And indeed, the Houses of Parliament were burnt down in something like the 15th and the 16th century uh, because there was a, a cleanup exercise going on where they were trying to burn the old, unused, and no longer useful tally rolls, and they got out of control. So there's another uh, example for you. Now, talking about um, changing things, here is the, the story of uh, Mary, uh, Queen of Scotland, or Mary Stuart. And those of you that remember the, the story around then, there were the religious wars going on, because Henry VIII had uh, declared UDI and set up his own church. Uh, and Elizabeth, was, Elizabeth I was in fact uh, supporting that. But her cousin, who had as much claim to the throne as she did, Mary Stuart, uh, was a supporter of the Catholics and was Queen of Scotland. Now she, for various reasons, sought refuge in England and was promptly incarcerated. Um, and there was a suspicion that she was actually plotting against the, uh, the Queen Elizabeth I. Um, and she thought, that is to say, Mary Stuart thought, she had a clear and secure channel of communication with her allies which involved her messages being put in the bones or barrels that were being used to transport things into the castle. And they were encrypted using the code. Now, it turned out that all of this was being monitored by Sir Francis Walsingham, who was the uh, General Alexander of the time, uh, the chief of security. And at one, uh, we got, they got to the point where um, Queen Elizabeth sent a message to Sir Anthony Babington, who was the chief plotter, saying, glad to hear, you know, you've got plenty of people on, on our side. And Sir Francis Walsingham added a postscript, which said, please will you tell me who they are? <laughs> and Sir Anthony Babington, in his reply, did. And that led to the gruesome deaths of the, the, the um, uh, of the people who were in fact uh, involved in that plot, and finally to uh, Mary Stuart losing her head in something like February 18, 1527, I think. 1587, So there we are. Now, this takes us right up to the First World War and the so called Zimmerman Telegram. Now, the first act that the uh, Royal Navy was given. The first orders they were given in 1914 was to search all the way across the North Sea to dredge up what were the um, fiber optic, the internet secure uh, superhighway of the time, which were the telegraph cables. And that meant that all the telegraph cables which went from Germany through to, um, through to the rest of the world, the only one that was left was one that went through cable and wireless in London. And so every message that Germany sent to the rest of the world was sent through a relay station at cable and wireless in London. And not surprisingly, every message was written down and passed to the so-called Room 40. Now it turned out that in, in uh, December 1916, a drunken head of, uh, head of station sent the same Christmas greeting mes mes message to all of his outstations using a series of different codes. And that meant that they had a crib. You know, it was a Christmas greeting, well, you know, a Christmas greeting line, and it was all these different codes. So he didn't take them long to break the codes. So when, in January 1917, Zimmermann, who was the foreign minister of Germany, sent a message to Mexico, to the attaché in Mexico, basically saying, if the Mexicans will join the German side, when we win, we will guarantee Mexico will get back uh, New Mexico and Texas, which is being disputed between Mexico and, uh, and, and the US for some time. 
that was quite um, something. So it then took a couple of months for the British to work out how they could let the US know about that without divulging to the Germans that they'd figured out how to crack their codes. So in the end, they managed to make it look as though the weak security inside Mexico had led to it. And this was one of the factors that brought the US into the war. And indeed, that image comes out of the US archives, would you believe? And for those of to, to move on to the other side, we've talked about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Those of you that know about the de Rothschilds, this is our bankers who uh, were referred to earlier on. Uh, the Rothschilds are known to be a very rich and powerful um, uh, family. Now, a lot of their money was made as a result of astute bets that were placed uh, just prior to the knowledge of who had won the Battle of Waterloo. Now, it turned out that once again, the de Rothschilds had actually used the high technology communications equipment of the day in order to find out who had won the battle 24 hours ahead of the British government. They had their spies with carrier pigeons. And those carrier pigeons sent the message across. And that allowed them to, uh, to, to, to do the right kinds of trades uh, and thus make a great deal of money. And it's interesting that only a couple of years back I read that a US hedge fund had paid $300 million to drill a hole through a mountain, which basically meant that they could put a fiber optic cable through that mountain that meant that their trades from, shall we say, New York got to the uh, Chicago Stock Exchange a few milliseconds ahead of those of their competitors. So having information in advance of other people is often a competitive advantage. So all of that was kind of really ancient history. So let's look at mechanization. There have been some weird and wonderful devices have been created over time. And many of these seem to be in um, the uh, Dresden Museum. And this, I don't know if you can all see it. This is an interesting idea. It is a, a thing called cryptological dividers. So you have what look like a pair of dividers with a turn button on them. And this turn button controls the displacement of the two ends of the dividers. So you can make what are effectively a series of dots or um, uh, arcs that depend upon the, um, the whose diameters depend upon the actual um, the, the actual setting of the thing, and so you can send a message. An interesting idea. I'm not sure whether it took off very well. Interestingly, in that same museum in Dresden, there is also um, a disc which. It's not photographed because it was damaged, which uh, is uh, effectively a resettable system for uh, encrypting messages uh, in, in a similar way. Now, another, another way was the so-called Jefferson disk. And this is an interesting, um, uh, an interesting device. It had 36 disks, each of which had around the circumference the alphabet. But each disk had a different uh, order of letters on it. And um, what you did was your code, if you will, your encryption key, was the order that you put the disks on the spigot. And when you put them on in the right order, you turned the disks until one of the rows gave you the message you wanted to send, and then any other row was the encrypted message. And that was, again, uh, something from the US in the uh, 18th and 19th century. Then, of course, I'm sure we're all familiar with these, the uh, Enigma machine and the so-called Fernschreiber, which was uh, a, an adapted telex machine. Now, those have been, uh, are interesting because they kind of led to what I would say was the beginning of the digitization, because clearly, a lot of the work to do with breaking the Enigma code was 
done as a mathematical exercise. And whilst prior to, to that, the main skill of a crypt, decryptor or a cryptologist were, were language skills, suddenly it became mathematical skills. And indeed, the, uh, uh, the Fern Schreiber had an encoding system which was based around the use of the exclusive or. So that leads us on to digitalization. And, and when we did this, we find that there are all these new and unexpected vulnerabilities that we had come up with. Now that's an interesting picture from uh, IBM's museum in Hursley. And I'm sure many of you can actually remember discs like that. I can certainly remember discs like that. Um, and uh, the, these, these are interesting because when we were selling these as ICL. One of the things that happened was one, one of the first first computers, the 2900 series computers we sold, we sold to the Ministry of Defence. And um, they had disks, very similar to that, exchangeable disks. And the standard contract at that point was that we knew the disks were going to fail. They failed all the time in a great cloud of magnetic dust. And what ICL did was ICL just went in and did a swap. And so when they sent the engineers in to do a swap, they turned up there and they found two men with guns in front of the broken disc. And they said, we're going to take that away. And these men with guns said, no, you're not. <laughs> because you might be able to deduce something from our secrets from what's on that disc. And this is, this is, this is the major problem that, you know, at this time, 8 megabytes and 30 megabytes was kind of a big amount of data. You look at what there is now. I mean, I've got a, a mobile phone which has 16 gigabytes on it, and it's kind of a, a mini in comparison to many people. And so the opportunity that this presents for things to go wrong is, uh, is immense. You, you, you don't just steal the odd message, you steal the whole, uh, the whole thing. So that led on to all kinds of ways in which you might want to uh, or be able to protect that data. And of, of those, encryption is probably uh, the, the most important. And uh, to, to, to give a quick history, the encryption that we now take for granted, which is the advanced encryption uh, system, uh, came out of work that was done in the 60s by a number of people, many of whom worked for uh, IBM, and uh, eventually in, in 1974 the, the US Department of Defense actually asked for a proper proposal for this, and IBM responded to that, and this eventually led into this system called AES, which is symmetric encryption. And the problem now that, that I constantly find is not that people break into encryption, but that it's how you persuade organizations that should know better to actually use it where it's appropriate, or to understand what it is. And the number of people who don't seem to understand, you know, uh, how, how these things work and how you could apply them in order to protect their intellectual property and so forth is, is truly uh, amazing. So, uh, encryption is a critical part of this. And part of the problem that, that led to the need for, uh, for, for protection of this data comes from the fact that you put so much data in a common place. And this, this process of defining how you protect access is, 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 is really a, an interesting um, exercise. And when you trace it back, you find that in the 1950s and the early 60s, the notion of a computer was it was a single device that sat in a single room that was used by one person or one job at a time. And so, for example, when you read about Leo, Leo, the Leo computer was used to do uh, certain kinds of calculation for what was in the Ministry of Defence. And that was 
controlled by physical access control that you, you know on a certain on a certain night the jobs were run by only by certain people who'd been accredited and uh, the stuff that went in and the stuff that came out was all properly and completely physically secured but as the computers got bigger and more powerful it became clear that more than one person could use it at once and indeed uh, they, they might need to. So in particular Massachusetts Institute of Technology started to work on a thing called Project Mac uh, which was supported again by the US, uh, US military and Project Mac started to define the architecture that you need in order to have a multi-user operating system with a proper security system built into it. And it's interesting that that architecture is the architecture that now underlies most of the, the systems that, that we use today. For example, it is the precursor to Linux, which is widely deployed. What is less well known is that um, George 3 and VMEB, but George 3 in particular, owed a lot to, uh, to that, to the security architecture, because what had happened was that the people who were involved in designing George 3 in the first place had heard about that work going on in MIT, and they'd gone over and listened to the various presentations and read the various works. So that actually became the embedded model where you have users with some kind of identification which with file store which is uh, not which is private but there is in order to allow you to have uh, shared uh, under control conditions shared files and shared parts of the file store it also led to the need for um, for some kind of identification, which uh, was the username and password. We'll come back to that. Now, uh, interestingly, VMEB uh, built on that really quite remarkably. And VMEB was a, a very interesting uh, uh, operating system in that it, it, it included in it many of the security features which are in advance of what you can, can get today. So VMEB, the notion of a virtual machine then was rather different to VMware's notion of a virtual machine but it was if you will all the levels uh, which are necessary to run a particular user's program and so the idea was that you had uh, a whole series of levels of uh, trust in the different components and there were two distinct virtual store models which coexisted. We're all uh, familiar with the um, paging model, which was the thing that resulted from the need to overlay programs that had got too big for the physical store. But at the same time as that, the VME, VMEB and the 2900 architecture included uh, a thing called segmentation which was that different areas of memory, whether or not they were being paged, could be assigned different levels of permission, and so that you could say, well, this particular area of store can only be accessed by the operating system, and this level of store can be operated by, shall we say, the middleware, and then finally you have the user layer. And so there was inherent protection against uh, many of the kinds of viruses that, that tend or won't attempt to get control at uh, a lower level through the physical implementation of the hardware which was then exploited by the, um, by the operating system. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, as VMEB was doing all of this, uh, nearly, nearly all the rest of the world were using <coughs> IBM. And IBM, in its usual uh, way, was selling everything as an extra. <coughs> and uh, it was amusing because when I first started with ICL in the 1960s, 
uh, I, the ICL operating systems automatically uh, allowed you to put uh, a, a magnetic tape on any deck and the operating system would find it. You just said, give me tape X, Y, or Z. Wherever you put it, you found it. That functionality was sold as an added extra cost as part of the IBM operating systems. Now, uh, so in, in the late 1970s, people started to sell extra things onto IBM to give added security for multi-user um, use of those systems. And, and the, um, the, the one that was the first one was IBM's uh, RACF, which was the uh, access control facility. And that was followed by um, another system which was called ACF2, and then one that was called Top Secret. And the latter of those two was in fact, uh, were in fact acquired by computer associates. And uh, so for some time I had a, a slight connection with, uh, with all of that kind of stuff. So IBM's RACF is also interesting because it became the basis of a, a, a Unix operating system called Secure Operating System, or CIOS, which was developed in Israel and finally was acquired by Memco and eventually arrived back at um, uh, CA. And I found myself uh, with a slight connection with that when I was at CA as well. And that was interesting because um, uh, that CIOS had also been the basis of what was then IBM's TAM OS. Uh, and um, uh, the, uh, the, the, there were certain negotiations which um, weren't very successful for IBM. So the notion that you can place much more uh, detailed control on what individual users can do with, uh, with the facilities of an operating system in a multi-user operating system. It took quite some time to develop, uh, but we're all really there in the beginning of the 1980s, just in time for Microsoft to throw it all away and start again. So um, again, part of this was the need to, uh, to, to, to identify users, and again, I, I wanted to know where this came from. And I think the notion of passwords is, is a very old one. It's not something that's specifically related to the computers. But it turns out that the, the best thing that you can find is that in the 1960s, uh, the, the people at MIT claim that on their system called CSS, they decided to build a password-based system and uh, according to the Wall Street Journal, the guy who invented that has deeply regretted it ever since because he says it's just a nightmare, the, what he has uh, created. And indeed, as you can see, uh, only a couple of weeks ago, we had the news that Yahoo had managed to lose 500 million people's um, uh, login details. You know, I mean, it's... Uh, Quite, quite something to lose such an amount of stuff. Now, in fact, it's interesting that this has developed onwards. And um, there, there are basically three approaches to uh, identifying yourself. And you can use them in combinations. There's so-called what you know, which is the password. What you have, which is the sort of um, uh, the credit card or the device, and what you are, which is biometrics. So it turns out that in the late 1970s, the, uh, uh, the CIA and the FBI were sort of tearing the hair out. And they said to one of their, um, uh, their, their, their computer people, why can't we have something like a watch clock? And watch clock was a device that had been invented which was to keep a, a check on um, uh, the, the physical security people who looked after buildings. And this was a device that uh, had a constantly changing 
sort of set of patterns which you had to use as you went round proving that you had actually gone and looked at a particular room or looked at a particular door to confirm that everything was all right. And the result of the, the challenge to say, why can't you have something like Watch Club led to what uh, effectively is one of the generic things that I'll call secure ID, uh, which are these devices that have quasi-random number generation, um, which is quasi-random because you can predict it. And so you can get a, a, a device which gives you a number which only you know and only the master server can confirm is correct. And so when you are challenged to put the, to identify yourself, you have to put the number in. And just as a, a little aside, one of the amusing stories that I came across was that you know how salesmen work. They think if we can convince the boss about something, then um, what we'll do is we will we will sell the device to uh, the rest of the business because the boss will stay just by it. So this guy was selling the equivalent of secure ID, not necessarily working for RSA, but so he said, what, I, what I'll do is I'll just show the, 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 the chief executive how powerful it is. So he gave one of these to the chief executive and set him up to use it. Now, so the chief executive the next day went to Singapore. But did he remember to take his device with him? No, he didn't. So the story goes that in the middle of the night in the UK, he had to ring his secretary up and ask her to go into the office, take this device out of its drawer where he had put it, and read the number out to him so that he could get into his important email, which was not quite the outcome that the salesman had hoped for. So nevertheless, these things are are, are really uh, quite ubiquitous and quite powerful. So Gemalto and other, other companies uh, uh, produce this kind of thing. And um, they must be, they must be uh, important because otherwise, why would it be that the Chinese or whoever uh, spend all that time and effort to break into the RSA system that underlay the secure ID uh, in order to be able to replicate it, and that cost RSA, according to Art Covelio, who, who said this on Radio 4, it cost them $60 million because they ultimately had to give all of their customers a new device. Now, biometrics is interesting because on the one hand, you, you don't see a great take-up of biometrics in, in industry, and uh, and there's all kinds of reasons being given for this, that you have to be, uh, shall we say, healthy and all this kind of thing. And yet, on the other hand, the Indian government is going through a massive program of creating a complete biometric database for everybody. And part of the purpose behind that is to uh, get, give everybody access to social benefits, to education, to healthcare, or whatever by them proving who they are. And this allegedly is being done in a way which uh, does work for people with disabilities and, and so forth. So that's where we are today. And yet, nevertheless, we still have vast numbers of people working with passwords. And we have these password databases being stored in a way which ultimately uh, turns out are being lost. So we talked about the, the access control models, the need for them, where they develop from, but not what they are. And so again, for through history, there has been this notion of what is officially called multi-level security, where you sort of say there are different levels of information. And during the Second World War, they even had not just top secret, but ultra, which was, and these levels of information are 
limited to certain numbers of people. So you have a notion of circles of trust and uh, limits on people. And indeed, uh, this was originally sort of built into the kinds of hardware that I saw and the kinds of systems that were installed by NSEL, where you would have networks that were top secret networks that were middle and networks that were uncontrolled with the ability for information to be moved upwards but an air gap between all of them. Now that uh, is, is sort of what was behind all of this. Then it's interesting that again, once again, as part of Project MAC, there was a paper written which produced this thing called the principle of least privilege. And this is an interesting idea because he wasn't actually talking about people. The idea of the principle of least privilege was to say that any computer module should only have the privilege that it needs in order to do its job. And so the, if, if you limit its privilege, then you limit its scope for going berserk and doing damage, as well as its scope for being uh, abused and, uh, and, and used by people for malicious intent. And this notion of the principle of least privilege is not something that people realized was originally invented as a control on pieces of software. And if only many of the uh, later operating systems uh, had in, indeed implemented that, there would be much less of a problem that we have with malware and so forth today. Now, um, at, this, uh, at around about the same time, the US Department of Defense was paying big bucks to the, to the university people to figure out how to build an access control model that could be used to control government type people from accessing the system. And that came up with this thing called the Bell La Padula model, which is, is, is sort of more roughly described as uh, mandatory access control. The mandatory comes because it is mandated by the rules that came from the president. <laughs> now, it's interesting that having, having said that in 1974 we had that, in the early 1980s, what happened was that Microsoft and others built groupware systems which, which were capitalized on the fact that shared information is actually quite powerful. And those systems use the opposite of mandatory access control, which is discretionary access control, which is what we all look, know roughly as being access control. So you can say, well, if I can get into my user on the computer, I can look at my photographs. If I email my photograph to somebody, then I leave it to the discretion of the recipient what they do with it. And not a week goes by that somebody's uh, indiscretions are subject to discretionary access control and go viral on the internet. And so the, the, the technology and the knowledge that uh, need, was needed to be able to control that all existed in 1974. And it's all being reinvented uh, in order to prevent people from copying DVDs and CDs and uh, as a way to try and control how people share information. But uh, so you have this balance, this balance between the value that comes from being able to share a document and work on it uh, concurrently with somebody else and the need to be able to share documents in a way which they can't pass on. So being able to say, well, I'm going to let you have my photograph, but if you try to pass it on to anybody else, they won't be able to see it. Now, that was, uh, that, that was one kind of thing that came out. The other thing, again, you see all of these things come from, uh, shall we say, military money. So military money, uh, wanted a, a better system to deal with how you control access in a hierarchy. And that led to the development of this thing called role-based access 
where what you actually have is a model that says that uh, depending on what you do, what your job is, determines um, kind of what you can see and what you can do with that information. And that roughly maps onto uh, things like groups and so forth that you will find in different kinds of operating systems. But it works most effectively for a simple role-based system. But when you say, when I was working for Computer Associates, I was a vice president, so I could sign off people's, um, uh, people's um, uh, expenses, and so I had all kinds of rules for that. Uh, but on the other hand, I worked in England, and so my email was subject to certain privacy constraints because of the fact that I was in England. I also happened to be a PR spokesperson, and that PR spokesperson uh, role gave me access to certain kinds of social media type uh, things which weren't clearly derived from where I sat in the hierarchy. So role-based access control has sort of soon met its limit and lots of people tried to implement it with more or less degrees of success. Um, and the latest, uh, if you will, the latest sort of kid on the block is this thing called attribute-based access control, where what you do is you say, instead of uh, taking what, uh, what someone's role is, you say what attributes do they have. Uh, and depending upon their attributes, you, they, they get permissions that uh, follow from these. And all of this then depends upon the trust you have in how these things have been assigned. But um, that's a, a quick history of access control models. Now, when we interconnected everything, then that made everything worse. And there are currently over 3.6 billion people connected to the internet. And there's probably twice as many devices um, since, I mean, I carry three around with me. So the internet was an, was an interesting evolution because until the 1960s, the notion of communications was based on point-to-point -point communication. You know, it was good stuff, what we did, which had a wire between there and there. And the development of the Strowager Exchange, which basically said, what we do is we connect lots of wires, uh, worked very well. But some strange people that were working in Berkeley uh, had this idea of what they call packet-based communications. So instead of having to have a wire to everybody, uh, what you had was a wire or, if you will, just, just like a radio system that sort of distributed information. And these packets were all individually going to go to different people. And that led to the thing called ARPANET. And indeed, the first node was connected in 1969 between two parts of the University of California. And the first thing that could be considered to be a, an email, a message, was sent over that. Now, that developed into, ultimately, what is known as TCPIP. And it led to the creation of things like electronic mail. So ARPANET was based on the notion of packet-based communications. And um, a lot of the technology then evolved in order to be able to deal with these packets, which was things like routers. And uh, initially, all of this was based on um, how you're going to overcome the unreliability of these networks, rather than putting concern on the fact that there might be malicious intent with the use of the networks. Um, and uh, the same is true from an electronic mail point of view. This was invented, if you will, as a, a, a thing that was only going to be used by benign people. And indeed, there was a big sort of, if you will, shoot out at the dawn of the 1980s. Because in the 1980s, the telcos who had been quietly sort of dozing in the background suddenly realized that something was up in this and their approach to everything which has been extremely successful because you know the fact that you can pick up a phone and call just about anywhere involves a lot of interconnection they said what we need is we need to step up the standards which is going to do this and so there was this 
attempt to create a set of open standards for network communication. And that set of open standards looked at the issues around security. And in order to solve them, it created something which was much more uh, complicated. So, for example, there was a secure email, but SMTP one. There was rows and other standards like that to do with secure communications, but TCP IP one, because they were lightweight and they had takeoff. Now, we're living with the, the results of that. And it's interesting to note, in, in fact, that's actually quite wrong, because it, the first firewall was not in 1994, it was actually in 1992, was it was something called Deck Seal. Now, it's not the, the beginning of the idea. The ideas were circulating in the 1980s. In 1988, there were people uh, writing emails saying we're getting a lot of viruses. Now, so this kind of evolved from the notion that you'd already got things like routers that were uh, managing traffic, but the firewall suddenly became a router, a device which was going to look at packets and decide whether or not it was going to let them through. The idea that there was going to be a malicious type of content, and that has, of course, uh, evolved from being a stateless um, packet sniffing filter to being stateful, looking at sequences of packets. And now we have the notion of um, application level firewalls, which are looking at the, the coherence of the kinds of traffic and different kinds of traffic, and all kinds of different um, uh, incarnations of firewalls, bastion hosts, and all things like this. Now, um, again, bless their cotton socks. The, uh, the US military was given the idea of what would we do in the case of Armageddon. But what's happened is there's been the nuclear strike and everything's gone, and so we just have to use whatever kind of public communications we can in order to be able to communicate with ourselves. And so they came up with this notion of the onion router. The onion router basically is uh, the idea that uh, at each point you pass through uh, one of these router networks that what, where you have come from is obscured and the only thing that is, is, is passed on is where you're trying to go to and your message is then passed on to the next step and coming back each, uh, each particular router can figure out where it had to send the result back but can't see where it came from. And this was invented as an idea in order to uh, allow the US military to continue in dire circumstances, but it was picked up by people who cons were concerned about privacy. Because people who uh, felt that you know, this internet was being snooped on by the CIA and everyone, and wanted their own privacy started to use it. And then, of course, the criminals realized that it was just what the doctor ordered. Because you can use this whilst obscuring your original identity and um, it makes it very hard to sniff on what you're doing. So I tell my students, if you're going to use it, you've got to assume that the majority of people that you now are going to talk to will be the FBI and the police force, because they're all in there as well. Um, uh, and, and so you have to know uh, what you're going to do. So that uh, led to this. And of course, opening up things, we had lots of vulnerabilities. And um, we've talked about all of these. In fact, vulnerabilities have been exploited since the, the, the dawn of time. But uh, in, in a quick thing, in 1974, there was a chap called Captain Zapp who was altering the clocks in AT&T exchanges so that he could make off-peak calls during the day. In 1986, there was two guys, one of whom was called Stephen Gold, who hacked into Prince Philip's Telecom Gold account. And uh, it's a long story, but basically, they were prosecuted under the 1980 Fraud Act. And this was thrown out. And so the politicians suddenly thought, well, uh, 
you know, we can't have people hacking into uh, Prince Philip, so something has to be done. And that led to the 1990 Misuse of Computers Act. Um, but, uh, so basically, now, if I knew your password and accessed your account without your permission, even though I did no damage, that is an offence under Section 1 of that Act. There were, when I looked yesterday, 78,521 vulnerabilities reported on the MITRE Com uh, Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures site. And, you know, it's the fact that we built all this stuff, which is full of holes, and people are still building things that don't take account of these holes, means that we have some of the problems that we have today. Uh, such as viruses and ransomware. Again, the history of viruses is the first one that is reckoned to be known is this thing called the Elk Clona virus, which surprisingly was for Apple, and it was a, a, a boot kit type virus that it, once you got it onto a disk, it will pass it on to the next one. Um, the first ransomware, interestingly, was in 1989, which was AIDS PC Cyborg, and in order to get your uh, files back, you at that point you had to send a check to an address in Panama. Mm -hmm. Now, ransomware is in fact the, the top 10, and it's small businesses that it's mainly targeted at, because small businesses will pay 500 euros just to get rid of the problem. And um, uh, so it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing that, that it's highly evolved. In that, if you get ransomware, they will take you to a, a really good website that's in about six or seven different languages that will tell you in detail how to buy a bitcoin, how to make your payment to, to, to get your stuff back. And you're now faced with, well, do I call the police? Because if I call the police, they'll probably find and close down the server that was going to give me the, the utility that was going to remove the ransomware. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, that's the problem you have. So viruses have moved from being something that was done to prove that you knew more than the machine to being a, a money-making exercise which is used to create the funds for organized crime. And uh, finally, we're going to move on to the securing of uh, uh, distributed data. And again, this is an interesting thing that um, the Philosopher's Stone was discovered, first of all, by this chap called um, uh, Trevor Cox in GCHQ, but it was so secret that he wasn't allowed to tell anybody. Uh, in 1997, uh, Rivet, Shamir, and Edelman pu published their patent for, uh, for this, and um, they produced the system for public and private key encryption, which is now uh, widely used. That is, um, that is, that is used uh, extensively. Uh, for example, anyone who uses a credit card, your credit card has a certificate on it, which is issued by European Mastercard and Visa, who run their own uh, circles of trust in order to, uh, to do this. Um, and this is all secured using public key uh, cryptography. Um, in the 1990s, this was going to be the next thing that was going to take over the world. And VeriSign was probably worth more than the United Kingdom. Uh, but eventually, it's uh, now, shall we say, come back to Earth and is being used extensively, uh, but in a very more controlled way. Now, the, the problem is that you keep moving trust around. So with public key cryptography, what you're doing is you are putting trust in the person or the organization that certifies the, the public key as being uh, the valid and correct one. And of course, so people attack the certificate authorities. 
And the net result of this is that there is a decreasing level of trust in the certificate authorities, and that the notion that you could have generic certificate authorities that everybody trusts is going backwards, and things like that, as I said, the European Mastercard visa depends upon a circle of trust, i.e. The, the certificates are issued by, published by, and used by a, a consortium, effectively. The same is true for identitrust, for high-value uh, transactions. So uh, everything now uh, to do with payment and payment on the internet is based around a belief in trust in uh, providers like very You know, when I do my online banking, I can, in my paranoid moments, look and see that Lloyds Bank have a certificate that was uh, uh, issued by Verisign. And I think, yeah, I can trust Verisign. Now, so trust has moved on. <laughs> so, uh, where, where people are saying that, in fact, actually, what you need to do is not to trust in the people and the uh, hierarchy of people involved in this, but rather to trust in the algorithms. And that led to the way the Bitcoin works. And bitcoins are interesting because they're based on three or uh, four pieces of research which started off in the 1970s with research into uh, unreliable communications. And people were, were saying, well, what do I do if I've got lots of systems that aren't necessarily reliable with communications channels that aren't reliable? How do I manage this? And eventually, the clever mathematicians managed to prove that actually there isn't a deterministic answer to it. And that came out as the um, paper which was written, which is called The Byzantine Generals Problem, where they talk about two generals on two hills with the enemy in the valley between them who want to coordinate their attack. And in order to coordinate their attack, they have to decide on a time when they can uh, they can attack. But if they send a messenger through the enemy, there is a chance the messenger will be killed and not get there, or that the message will be altered. And so how do you deal with this? So that is what has led to the answers for this. So there is no deterministic answer, but there are stratagems that you can use that will help you to, um, uh, to increase the probability that you've got the right answer. At the same time as, as that, there was this interesting patent which came from the USAF, <coughs> a man called Sergeant Merkel, who uh, proved a way of being able to uh, prove the authenticity of a group of messages in one block as opposed to having to prove the authenticity of messages, um, each one as they came along. And that was called the Merkel tree. And all of those things are used in uh, the Bitcoin system, where effectively what, uh, what happens is a Bitcoin transaction is uh, confirmed by a so-called miner by solving a computational problem, which is very difficult to solve, but very easy to prove is right. And that is supposedly going to give us algorithmic trust. But in fact, actually when you look at it, there are all kinds of uh, issues which I talked about in another, uh, in another talk. So where we are now is when you look, this was the World Economic Forum report in 2016. And this is a heat map of likelihood versus impact. And cyber attacks and interstate conflict are up in the top right hand corner. So cyber is in the hot area of global risks because we now depend on cyber infrastructure to be as efficient as we are. <coughs> we are fighting these conflicts between liberal views on what is required for privacy versus authoritarian views that say we need to watch what everybody's doing in order to 
keep ourselves secure. We are building an internet of things out of devices that are primitive and are certainly not being designed with security in mind, and who knows what's going to happen with artificial intelligence. So, uh, we've come a long way, and that's a short history, which uh, basically says we, we've figured out how to build all this stuff, but uh, I'm not sure whether we've created something that's not going to bite us. So this is an age-old problem, and the industrialization of uh, information has made this problem worse. So that's my talk. Thank you very much, everyone. Because of the next generation, we lost it, or it was considered too constricting, such as you know, when the mainframe lost its uh, power because of the Unix box, because they were seen as to be more connect connectable. Are are we learning any lessons from having the things, you know, proper secu security built in, or are we still learn doing things is? Uh, trying to ensure this, that its uh, accessibility, uh, its connectivity, while well, the security is the paramount. Well, I, I think if you look at history, where we have these revolutions in thought or technology, what happens is that people very quickly figure out the benefits that they can get by doing things, and they rush after those benefits without necessarily taking account of the downside. And there are lots of examples of this in the Industrial Revolution, in road transport, in trains, and in other areas like that, which basically show that uh, people run after the benefits, then slowly but surely the problems start to catch up with them, and it takes one or two disasters <laughs> in order to actually cause people to, or if you will, the mood to change in such a way that the acceptability of the problems reduces. We have a generation that is not concerned with cyber security, but we have a generation that's very concerned with physical safety. You know, when I was a child, I rode a bicycle and I didn't have a helmet. Now you are some kind of child abuser if your child is riding down the street without a helmet on. So the perception is this has changed. And if we look at uh, the case of um, uh, rail transport, the, the dead man's handle, the, 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 the device that stopped a train that went through a red light was invented in Germany in something like the 1890s. It took the train disaster in 1952, where 250 people were killed in a series of rail crashes that went one after the other in the fog in train, for British Rail to actually uh, use that system and install it. Now, that's the example I get. So I think it will catch up, but it will take the it will take a couple of disasters for it to uh, to to really um, follow. It's okay. Yeah, there's a oh, question for the for you, Mike. Yeah. This, uh, I do. I do quite a lot of work with various charities that help the um, slightly more ancient than the people, and there is still a huge amount of distrust of the internet. You know, people. Um, just won't use the internet for uh, banking, for uh, online shopping, for you know, for that sort of stuff because they just don't trust it. 
And I think there's a, there's a, there's a huge hurdle there. And I trust it. I'm about to up, but... <laughs> Any thoughts? Well, I, I've talked to a number of University of the Third Age groups on that kind of question. Um, I, I think that there is always some resistance in older people to change. But in many of the groups I've spoken to, nearly all of them are using the computer. Mm. And it's, they, they may not trust it, but when you, when you explain to them what the risks are and how to manage those risks, yeah. they're more than capable of, of doing that. Yeah. I, I, I do that quite a bit with, with some of the, 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 old, the old people that I do. I just say, get another credit card, but have, have a limit of 50 quid on it. Mm. So if something goes a little bit pear shaped, the most you're going to lose is 50 quid. Yeah, that's, that's right. So, so prepaid credit cards is, 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 a, is a good is yeah, a good yeah, yeah. way of, of, of managing that risk. But um, you know, nothing <coughs> without risk. Uh, what you have to do is to judge the risk versus the utility, and that's what really matters. Yes, um, the last slide, or perhaps the last slide, but one brought the blockchain into play. And I've been reading a lot about the blockchain, and all I can find in books that are costing me a 10 or 15 pounds a time is PR puff about how it's going to change the way we behave. There's virtually nothing that tells me how to implement it. And it's very worrying when you have this puff, PR puff for a solution to a massive problem that is self-auditing, well, algorithmic trust, as you, as you put it, when you can't actually find, even for us, and we're technologists, but find mechanism that find good descriptions of how the thing is implemented and how it can be platformed effectively. Got any thoughts on that? Well, I, I, yes, I have, because I gave a talk on and in fact, you may be able to find it and it listen to the system. It is on the system. You can never be on the system. Now, it's on, on our system. It's, yes, yes. Yeah. So uh, it's on the BCS uh, okay. owner group, and, and there's a video of me giving it in the separate slides. Now, what I, what I actually did was I did a risk assessment of it, <laughs> um, which kind of implies we know how it works. Well. So I've been using it as a way to teach my students about public key cryptography because it basically depends upon that. And if you say to the public key cryptography, most of them just go to sleep. But if you say, would you like to know how Bitcoin works? Yeah. They, they're interested in it. So it isn't actually very difficult. The, 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 the original paper by uh, Sashi Nakamoto Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, it is in fact fairly clear in what it does. You just have to sort of understand the maths that are there behind it. Now, um, like all of these things, like uh, the public key uh, PKI thing in, in, in the 90s, the people jump on the bandwagon and this is one of the problems with the whole of the IT is that the business model is that the first man to get a product out wins because the, the, the challenge is once somebody's bought one thing, how do you get them to throw that away and buy another thing? And then, um, and then you're going to sell yourself to one of the big companies who will pay loads of money. And so we've already got that, that IBM has just in last February sort of announced that they've joined the game and they've got a whole division set up doing uh, blockchain in the financial services industry based around a system called Hyperledger. And uh, there is a group of people in, in a, 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 a sort of a, a, an IT nursery, uh, what do they call it, it's um, uh, run by Barclays Bank, 
out somewhere near my end uh, that are busy building all kinds of stuff based on blockchain. And so there are platforms. There's Eris, and there's Ethereum, and Hyperledger, and Bitcoin are all platforms that you can use to build your own blockchain application. So, uh, and even I've, I've written a paper which is going to come out in the IET Professional Journal soon, I believe, on, on this. So, and hopefully that will that will give you some uh, some idea of uh, of what it's all about. Look forward to reading it. Any more questions? Thank you very much, man. Thank you. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.